So welcome to the ACP Problem Solving in Oncology webinar series. My name is Laura Feeney and I'm a member of the ACP Trainees Committee. I am pleased to be able to welcome you today to our webinar series, which has been set up to provide equal educational opportunities to trainees and fellows in medical and clinical oncology across the UK. Webinar is a uh, will generally be held on the third Tuesday of each month from 6 o'clock to 7.30 p.m. with expert-led presentations and case discussions focused on a particular tumour type or topic. Today's session will cover renal cancer and there will be one presenter um, from um, our expert panellists covering systemic anti-cancer therapy in advanced renal cancer. Um, this is deviating from our um, planned uh, two speakers um, and apologies it's due to unfor um, unforeseen clinical duties. So the educational contents um, of these meetings are entirely non-promotional but we are proud to have the webinar series sponsored by Pfizer Limited, world-renowned leader in oncology pharmaceuticals. More information is available on their website. Just to remind you our online educational platform delivered by EBN Health is live Webinar sessions are recorded and made available to all ACP members via this website. In addition, the website offers access to the ACP Problem Solving and Oncology book series. To access this, go to www.acplibrary.ebnhealth.com. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce our first speaker of the evening, Dr. Bala Venugopal. He is a consultant medical oncologist in Beetson, West of Scotland Cancer Centre and honorary senior lecturer at University of Glasgow. He specialises in renal and neurological cancers. Uh, he is an NHS Research Scotland Senior Research Fellow with an active research portfolio of clinical trials and has actively contributed to practice changing trials. He has set up the Scottish Renal Oncology Group and also has active interest in undergraduate and postgraduate training. This evening, he will be providing us with an overview of syst systemic anti-cancer therapy in advanced renal cancer. Dr. Benyukapal, over to you. Please go ahead and share your screen. Systemic, renal systemic therapy in renal cancer, if we were to be having a talk uh, maybe 10 years ago, this would be a five minutes uh, talk, but things have changed and we have plenty of options. And in the next 20 or maybe longer minutes, I would uh, talk through the past, the present, and hopefully some insight into future options for the management of uh, advanced RCC. So this is the current landscape in advanced RCC. The one, uh, the blocks, this row of blocks in the top or first line, I have to, uh, it's, uh, I mean, I am I'm, I'm, I'm Scottish based uh, and this is heavily Scottish uh, oriented, but uh, it applies to the NICE and the Cancer Drug Fund approved drugs as well. But only thing is to add the cabazantinib in the top line. So there are, there are, there are four uh, wedge of TKI, cabazantinib, sinitinib, pasopinib, and uh, two IO based combinations, EP, Nevo, and uh, Avelumab Axi in NHS England and in Scotland, we have three TKIs, asinitinib, pasopinib, and tibozinib. We don't have cabazantinib for poor or intermediate risk, but we have pembroaxi uh, and uh, available and EP nevo in um, advanced first line setting. Uh, in the bottom line, uh, bottom row, we have at least five different drugs uh, or, which can be used after failure of the first line therapy. Now, uh, let's just go back in time. I'm just, uh, just indulging myself uh, with the Back to the Future cartoon. Uh, if you look back not long ago, maybe 15 years ago, uh, prior to early 2000, the management of RCC, uh, the clinics will be very quiet. We had only interleukin or interferon, uh, mainly interferon. I have to say interleukin is only in specialist centers. Some centers like Christie still do that. So even by chance, one would see a response uh, more than uh, well, equal to 5%. So essentially these drugs, the chemotherapy, multiple uh, options and the hormone therapy did not work. There were a group of patients uh, uh, who were sensitive to immunotherapy uh, and uh, these were typically in low T 
teens, uh, these patients, but we did see the so-called probable tail of the curve even in those times with the durable responders of five to seven percent. And this is the uh, couple of my curve of a survival plot from uh, a trial looking at high dose interleukin-2 versus interferon in the metastatic RCC. The, uh, in the PFS with this immunotherapy, whether it's the current generation of immune checkpoint inhibitor or the older era of the interferon interleukin, the PFS is not significant, but then the overall response rate and the median duration of response is, uh, is durable. And if we focus on the tail of the curve, as we call it, even in those times with interleukin and interferon, there was uh, around five to 10% of patients who did respond we, I mean, people who are treating melanoma, training in melanoma, are more used to this, the um, famous uh, epilimumab curve, which there is a 30% durable response, uh, responders. But we had this curve responders even before the onset of immune checkpoint inhibitors. So in those days, uh, with interferon only the option, uh, there was not much of an uh, intervention and uh, people were essentially trying to see whether they should get, be treated at all and to allow the treatment decision, there was prognostic variables. And uh, this is the uh, what the Mozer criteria, uh, basically Robert Mozer with his pulse in various uh, large uh, single centers in the US, looked at outcomes from around 500 patients retrospectively and um, found that there are five variables which are uh, prognostic of the outcomes. Uh, one is hemoglobin less than upper limit of normal, lactate dehydrogenase, the metabolic indicator, greater than 1.5 times upper limit of normal, hypercalcemia, poor performance status, and the time from RCC diagnosis uh, to the initiation of systemic anti-cancer treatment. The shorter the time, the aggressive the cancer, so that is an uh, indicator of poorer outcome. So it's uh, each, each of these points scores one, and if a patient does not have any of the risk factors, they are uh, classed as favorable or good risk patients. Uh, and if a patient has more than three, three to five, they are poor risk. So the median overall survival was 13 months. And I would probably request you to kind of hold on to that figure right now. Uh, and we can refer back to that. Uh, but it was a spectrum. Uh, so it ranged from five months to 30 months, uh, uh, the response rate, uh, the overall survival. So essentially, you could class this. These are kind of placebo patients. Uh, interferon was the best, at the best, a toxic placebo. Further to that, we had more understanding of the uh, biology of uh, uh, RCC, uh, particularly the, uh, the interaction between the VHL and the HIF pathway. So HIF, uh, hypoxia inducible factor, is a transcription factor, which upon transcription into the nucleus releases HIF responsive elements that are typically pro-angiogenic, the, all the VEGFs and PDGF and the um, fibroblast growth factor, so vascular endothelial growth factor, platelet-derived growth factors, and then they interact with the receptor tyrosine tyr tyr kinases for, for resulting in endothelial proliferation. In, in normoxic condition, so in normoxic condition, the HIF has um, attached to uh, proline and finally uh, earmarked or consigned to proteasomal degradation by the ubiquitination. Uh, but in hypoxia, the HIF is induced, which then translocates into the nucleus, releases the transcription factors, which then promotes endothelial proliferation. This pathway is very tightly knit and that's controlled by VHL, which is a one hippolindo gene uh, in chromosome three. And it's an, um, in VHL syndrome, this particular pathway is abrogated, resulting in the constitutional activation of HIF, even in normoxic conditions. So rather than the HIF being ubiquitinated and destroyed by the proteasomes, they're constitutively active and then they release constantly the pro-angiogenic signals. So this is the, this is a cartoon that, that set the stone for a variety of uh, what we call this TKIs, the wedge of TKIs, the, all the IBs and the MAPs. Uh, and following the discovery and the invention of these drugs, uh, we, we had a variety of drugs, uh, notable trials published here. I'm, I'm happy to share the presentations. You may want to refer to that. So sinitinib, pasopinib, tivosinib, cabazantinib, these are the first line TKIs 
um, and all pre predominantly the the Senatineb or Paso Panevan tubers in a so-called first generation TKIs were all in the early 2000. Cabazantineb was trialed later in 2016 to 2017. This is a, just a snapshot covering all the uh, pivotal uh, results. Uh, so if you look at it, it's not that difficult to follow. It's a, it's a tale of halves and uh, one thirds, perhaps. So all the drugs have a partial response of 30% or so. So uh, none of the patients had a complete response, uh, which is defined by the uh, absence of any measurable disease per resist. Uh, so I'm not. I, I'm. I'm just assuming you all know about the PRs and STs and um, CRs. So uh, PRs, 30 percent. Uh, again, with sinitinib, pasvapenib, or tevozinib, or even carbazantinib. The hazard ratio. The, the all these trials were PFS driven, uh, and the hazard ratio should be at least more than 0 0.5 uh, or, 0, or less than 0 0.5, depending on how we say it. The PFS was typically 11 months with um, the TKI compared to uh, either interferon um, hazard ratio changes, but because the pass open uh, was compared against placebo, the, it's basically at the, the patient's progress on the first scan if they are not treated. So again, here we look at the MSKCC. At the time, it was mainly the MOTSA criteria or the Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, Cancer Center criteria. Um, it's in real world practice, we would see uh, a, predominantly a poor and intermediate risk. So around 70 to 80% of the patients we see in our clinics are poor or intermediate. But as with many clinical trials, they do have a kind of a predisposition towards the fittest of the fit patients. So, um, so they have a slightly over representation of the good risk patients. But if we see the overall, the overall response rate, the best overall response rate was around two years with this treatment. Cabazantinib was looked at only at the poor and intermediate risk, and in keeping with the poor risk and the intermediate risk prognosis, their outcomes were poorer. And that's kind of the timeline that results, uh, resulted in approval of uh, at least uh, half a dozen TKI, uh, and axitinib was a second line TKI, which we can touch about in later. So, so what are the factors that we in the clinic uh, take into account to treat a patient uh, as with any uh, solid tumor or even any malignancy, the performance status uh, plays a vital role in our decision-making process. Uh, and, and, and what is the intention? We know that these people don't get CR uh, with these TKIs. Uh, so we look at the time from nephrectomy, the, uh, any previous uh, skeletal disease requiring radiotherapy, and also the disease-related factors. The uh, hype, I mean, the RCC is, uh, is famously called the physician disease meaning it can have a variety of paraneoplastic manifestation, hypercalcemia, fever, sweats, thrombocytosis, anemia, and it's also kind of a pro-inflammatory cancers uh, showing up with raised, uh, leukocyte, raised white cells and uh, CRP. So these are the kind of the disease-related factors we factor into the treatment process. And then these also resulted in the formation of the modern era of prognostic factors, uh, which uh, was an international uh, collaboration uh, led by Daniel Heng uh, from uh, from Canada, um, looking at easily manageable or easily collectible uh, prognostic factors. So three factors uh, from the full blood count: so hemoglobin, white cells, and uh, platelets, and performance status, hypercalcemia, and time from diagnosis to treatment. These are the prognostic factors that are calculated at the time of the patient starting the treatment, not at the time of diagnosis. So here, again, if you can look at the median survival, there is almost a doubling of the median overall survival with the uh, advent of the wedge of TKIs. Uh, again, it's a spectrum, uh, zero to six, higher the uh, number of uh, risk factors, the poorer the outcome. So a patient with good prognosis, um, uh, RCC uh, at the time of the publication, um, it was not reached, but subsequent follow-up showed it was around 48 months or four years. And a poor prognostic patients who has greater than three uh, prognostic uh, adverse prognostic factors as a median overall survival of around nine months with this treatment. And the intermediate risk is right in the middle, around two and, two and, a, two and a quarter or 27 months. 
so again, our treatment decision is based on the intention of the treatment. So unlike other cancers in RCC, because there are a group of patients who might, uh, particularly favorable risk patients who might not necessarily uh, have come into harm's way, in those days, we still, uh, we had an option of surveillance. So we would not be intervening uh, uh, to uh, systemic anti-cancer treatment until we have a clear indication of the uh, pace of the uh, pace and kind of the disease, the symptoms, uh, and obviously the patient's preference as well. Until we started to use immunotherapy, uh, I think I promised this is my last uh, uh, slide about the, about the matinees or cinemas. So immunotherapy comes back in renal cancer in a, in a different way, uh, following the success of use of this immune checkpoint inhibitors in um, solid malignancies. To, just to give a very preliminary overview of the tumor immunosurveillance. So the tumor uh, cells and the tumor antigens are shared uh, in, by the tumor. Uh, and uh, these are recognized by the, uh, the dendritic cells or the antigen presenting cells, which then present the tumor antigen to the inactivated T cells, which get primed uh, and activated following which they differentiate it into effector cells or, 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 or the memory cells in the nodes or in the circulation. The activated T cells upon uh, binding to the tumor cells mounts an anti-tumor response resulting in tumor lysis. So it's kind of a very simplistic and very uh, infantile way of explaining the immunosurveillance, but it is a bit more complicated than that. Dwelling into the T cell tumor cells or dendritic cells, T cell, um, Interaction is where the immune checkpoints uh, come into the play. Uh, we have the um, co-stimulatory and the inhibitory um, pathways in the uh, immune checkpoints, the CTLA4, the commonest one, which is uh, uh, which prevents essentially the dendritic cells uh, to from priming the T cells and they act as a breaks for the T cell activation. The PD-1 is expressed uh, predominantly in the uh, tumor cells and the binding of the tumor cells to the uh, T cells uh, is inhibited when there is expression of the PD-1. The checkpoint inhibitors essentially inhibit these molecules, either the PD-1 uh, or the CTLA-4, and there are a variety of other uh, checkpoints as well that are in the genesis right now. The, uh, this, these are the uh, collisions uh, who in their living life uh, in their active professional life were given the uh, Nobel Prize for the discovery of um, CTLA-4, uh, James Allison and PD-1, uh, Dr. Honjo from Tokyo. Again, you would all know all the different types of um, inhibitors. Uh, the commonest ones uh, which target the PD-1 pathway are the nivolumab and Pembro. The PDL one pathways are the atezolizumab, avilumab, dervalumab. The CTLA-4, the forefather or the forerunner is Ipilimab, and the uh, newer one is the Tremilimumabs. So the first trial to show activity of RCC, uh, sorry, activities of immune checkpoint inhibitors in this uh, uh, setting was Checkmate 025, which is a second line or beyond uh, trial uh, after failure of one or two prior wedge of TKI in clear cell RCC. Uh, and patients were randomized in a one is to one fashion to either um, Eurolimus or nivolumab. Nivolumab in those days was given uh, in um, in two weekly basis uh, yeah, based on, on body weight, three milligrams per kilogram body weight. Um, and that was the first study at the time to show uh, a overall survival advantage in second line setting. There was a six months improvement in the overall survival with uh, patients treated with uh, nivolumab two, two, two months, about two years compared to just 19 points up around 20 months. Now I have still time. Uh, I can pace my talk depending on the time. Uh, Dan or Laura, let me know whether I can carry on with the same pace or if you want to wind up, I can walk, talk or skip the slides. Um, so the, the, the current slides um, uh, are all about uh, uh, the current era of first line trials, I see the message that uh, Tom is joining, so I'll try to stick to my time schedule. So, so there are uh, there are at least five uh, current uh, 
uh, era uh, first line trance um, and they all have the same pattern uh, all contemporaneous pretty much contemporaneous trials looking at treatment naive clear cell uh, rcc patients uh, patients are uh, randomized to the standard of care which is sunitinib uh, and uh, and then the experimental arm either becomes an io io or an io tki the uh, I'm trying to multitask here, and I think I've done it. So the Checkmate 214 is the uh, key trial which looked at a combination of IO, IO, IO which is Epilimumab plus Nevo, Epinevo for future reference. In treatment naive patients, uh, they had an induction dose of Epinevo uh, three weekly for four doses, followed by maintenance Nivolumab uh, at the dose of three mix per K body weight two weekly. And was compared against sunitinib, there were three different endpoints, overall survival, overall response rate, and PFS. The PFS alone as an endpoint in the IO-based trial is difficult because the PFS might not necessarily uh, split, uh, and it's an OS and overall survival and overall response rate that's relevant for typically IO-based trials. Um, so the headline figures are that, uh, that this was a well-balanced trial. Uh, the, the key uh, endpoints were looking at intermediate and poor risk, but they also included a subgroup around 200 patients with favorable risk groups. Uh, and it was a well-balanced trial. And uh, you can see that I will talk, touch about the nephrectomy. Majority of the patients would have had nephrectomy, around 80% of the patients. The, the PFS, there was not much difference in the first nine months, but then after the nine to 12 months, this, the curve starts to split. As a hazard ratio resulting in 15% reduction of risk of uh, peer progression or death. This is the uh, this is outcome from uh, four-year follow-up data, which shows that there is a 50% survival probability in the group of patients treated with epinevo, uh, which is astounding. Uh, and it may be that we are starting to see this kind of the tail of the curve. Uh, in these uh, RCC uh, patients who are treated with IO, uh, IO combination. And, and we, we probably have not touched about the kind of various histology, which we'll do later as we go on. Uh, the sarcomatoid features are uh, typically uh, a manifestation of a poor uh, outcome. And these patients uh, typically have a significant burden of disease, younger age at presentation, and they don't always respond to uh, TKIs. And, and these drugs, uh, are effective even in sarcomatoid features where we see uh, a median overall uh, survival around 31 months. I mean, it's significantly shorter than the uh, clear cell, but still uh, uh, we do see an improvement from 13 months to thir 31 months, almost like flipping of the numbers. Again, with these drugs, these are omnipotent and omnipresent, the immune, immune system. So any, any essentially you can get itis of any part of the body, you can get body itis. Uh, uh, so commonest itis being the colitis and uh, the nephritis and uh, hepatitis, but it can cause any uh, organ damage and the awareness that it can cause damage and the uh, recognition of uh, treatment, so recognition and early intervention is very relevant. Uh, next generation of uh, trials looks at the, uh, the combination of um, TKI plus IO, because if you see here that the PFS curves split uh, later, so you want to have a quicker response. So that's where the combination of the TKI and IO comes into the play. Uh, the axotinib uh, was chosen as a backbone of this combination primarily because axotinib is thought to be a more precise and specific TKI. It's a cleaner TKI with a short half life, six to eight hours. So you can differentiate what the side effects are quickly. And it was uh, in combination with Avelima, which is a PDL one uh, and, um, inhibitor. Uh, and again, as I said before, it's a similar trial uh, population, clear cell RCC, measurable disease, PD-1 staining. The PD-1 is not a predictive biomarker in RCC, despite multiple trials trying to demonstrate that. Uh, the endpoints were PFS and overall survival. So uh, the idea of joining a wedge of TKI to the uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor is such that the T, the the, the angiogenic properties, uh, not only will does it result in the normalization of the blood vessels and allows the uh, um, recruitment of the immune T cells into the tumor, the angiogen anti-angiogenic drugs also have uh, a reduction of the immune suppressing cells, as in they have a negative effect on the negative uh, suppressors of the uh, T cells. So they allow in enhanced T cell response, particularly removing the CD8 suppression. 
and Avelma particularly, uh, uh, three clinical models have shown there are uh, in, in options of the antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity, the ADCC resulting in natural killer cell mediated cell lysis. So the kind of the idea is that it's a synergistic effect one plus one equals 11 rather than one plus one equals two. Um, I'll skip that. Uh, so it shows that the PFS, uh, there was an improvement in the PFS uh, in PDL1, uh, and that was also noted in overall population. So it's almost doubling of the PFS from eight months in sunitinib to 14 months or so with um, Avelimab and Axe. Currently, um, the, the response rate was clearly uh, uh, favoring the combination, and you would see the similar kind of pattern. The, if you remember, the response rate in monotherapy TKI was 30% on an average, and we are starting to see 42, 50 with, uh, now with Avelimab Axi, and the few further trials will show it's almost coming to 70. The uh, other endpoint was overall survival. Um, it's, uh, the data is still immature, but uh, so far it's not met the endpoint of improving the overall survival, whether it will improve, it remains to be seen because there are multiple patients who have post-progression other lines of therapy as well. Uh, the, the side effects are this relatively well tolerated. There is a notion that compared to a PDL1 versus a PD1 versus a CTLA, the PDL1 has a lesser toxicity profile. Uh, although some could say, well, it also results in lesser activity anti-tumor wise. So uh, the, the number of patients who had significant grade three uh, slash four toxicity uh, or immune related A is, is less than 10. Patients do have immune related uh, infusion reaction uh, grade one or two predominantly, and it's all uh, heavily in the front loading one to, two, one to four infusions. Around 10% of the patients are quite steroids. Again, that's a sign of the clear indication of the uh, time and the number of uh, um, immune-related events. NICE, well, CDF has approved uh, Avelimab and Axotinib uh, in NHS uh, England, and SMC has approved Avelimab and Axotinib, and for that matter, EPNEVO as well uh, in NHS. The other key study, uh, 426, Kino 426, uh, which is again similar trial design, but in place of uh, Avelimab, it's Axitinib, which is administered as a three weekly cycle. There was a two year stopping rule. Uh, the endpoints was overall survival and PFS. Uh, again, it's slightly better results compared to the uh, uh, other IOTKI. The um, hazard ratio was 0 0.61. 15.1 months is a PFS seen in the Pembroaxi group compared to 11 months. There, there is a slight dis difference in the patient population, but overall, this is a very effective drug. This is an update that was presented in ASCO uh, two weeks ago, where there, the response seemed to be uh, continuing even after the patient stopped at the two year stopping point. Uh, I'm afraid with the NICE and the CDF not allowing Pembroaxi in the NHS England, the, I suppose the day-to-day -day use in NHS England is, uh, is not, well, it's non-existent unless it's in private sector. But in Scotland, we have the option of uh, 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 Pembroaxi, uh, and we do see that it is a safe drug, uh, and we do uh, see uh, responses which are quite rewarding. So we are seeing there is an improvement in the PFS that goes beyond the two-year stopping rule, uh, by, and uh, that is also shown in the overall survival as well, where the hazard ratio is 0.73, this 45 months, almost four years uh, survival coming with these drugs. The response rate is doubling uh, from 30 uh, in what we saw in TKI, uh, owner therapy to 60. Here in, in, in the head-to-head -head comparison, it's around uh, 40% versus 60%. We, we are not that hung up on CRs, but it's nice to tell the patients that all the disease that you see on the scans has disappeared. That gives a, a feel of endorphin rush both to the patient and clinicians. But the CR is of not, not much value apart from the fact that, well, that maybe the tumor related symptoms are definitely going to be less, but we will still be carrying on. We do not know whether CR will allow us to stop the drugs although the idea is that you would feel emboldened, but we are not stopping the drug. So the PR, and the most important thing is the PD. The, this is a group of patients whose best response is progression of disease. So if that is the case, these are the patients who are going to do poorly and we need to focus on them. The side effect profile, slightly a more um, hepatitis, uh, whether it's due to the interaction between TKI, axitinib, or pembrolizumab, we are not sure, but, but this is manageable. Um, uh, so these are the key trials that are relevant to the current practice. 
uh, talking about the future, there are two couple of two trials. One is a Checkmate 9 ER, which uh, includes uh, one of the best TKIs, the Cabazantinib, and the known uh, IO nivolumab and combat against sunitinib. And it showed that, surprise, surprise, uh, there was an improvement in the PFS. It's, it's almost doubled. It's one of the best hazard ratios that we are seeing. And the overall survival also improved. It's early days. It's not reached. Uh, 55, 27 complete response rates is around uh, 8%. Uh, but these are, again, maturing data. The toxicity are manageable. And it also works in the sarcomata uh, differentiated patients as well. I'll just skim through. Um, the last trial, which has just been presented uh, earlier this year, is the CLEAR trial, Pembrolenvatinib. Lenvatinib is a uh, different kind of TKI, which targets predominantly the FGF, the fibroblast receptor, uh, fibroblast growth, growth factor receptor, but also uh, VEGF TKI. So there's a three-arm study comparing Pembroaxi, Lenvatinib plus Evrolimus or Sunitinib. We'll just focus on Lenvatinib and Pembro alone. It's a PFS alone is 24 months. If you remember the overall survival with these drugs in first line setting was 24 months. But with these improvements, we are pushing the PFS alone to 24 months. That's astounding. Uh, and, and the hazard ratio for overall survival is around on 0.66. We have not seen the data yet because it's still maturing. I'll just stop bloating or gloating about this drug. The overall response rate 71%. So we have doubled the PFS, and we have also doubled the overall survival uh, over 10 years with the group of these drugs. I'll just summarize this, um, all the data in one slide. It is a crowded slide showing it is a crowded space. There are many five options, um, which uh, will uh, hopefully at some point be available for use. But right now we have um, the um, Epinevo and Avelimabaxi and or 4 to 6, the Pembroaxi, depending on the region that you are living in or practicing in. The ESMO guidelines take into account the current fact and the current evidence. So Pembroaxi or Carbonevo, they are the preferred uh, first line option in favorable risk uh, groups. In favorable risk, the sunitinib, pasopinib, or tibosinib, as in the monotherapy with TKI is also not an unreasonable alternative, particularly in patients who have contraindication or particularly people who are of uh, that good a performance status where you are worried about the onset of immune related events. In intermediate and poor risk, uh, AP Nevo is added to the other IO TKI combo. And if the patient can't have any of those, you can have cabazantinib or other TKI. So we have, it's almost like a breast cancer where you have like seven or six multiple line, well, options, all not multiple lines, but for the first line, we are now spoiled for choice. We are around four IO, IO or IO TKI options and four TKI options. So eight drugs in first line. ASCO, sorry, the EAU, they can't keep up with all the, all the, recommend, all the um, advances. But I, I, we talked about the first line. We'll just talk about the later line. In the later line, there is no evidence. And any drug that has not been used in first line is essentially being used in second line. So because we have been focusing mostly on first line and we are not moved much in the second line. That's where we are. But these are the kind of pivotal second line trials. Uh, I mean, look at the timelines in 2006 to 2012. So all of this predates the use of the IO uh, or IO TKI. So we are talking about a PFS of four months to seven months. And we are talking about response rate between 1.8 with Evrolimus or up to 25% with, uh, with Checkmate uh, with this Nivolumab. Again, if you want, you can read through the reference later. I'll just skim through the pivotal trials. Again, uh, all the studies are focused only on clear cell RCC, but then we know that the RCC is not a homogeneous uh, uh, entity. There are 14 different subtype of non-clear cell, the commonest one being the papillary and the chromophobes, but there are multiple other subtypes. And even the papillary, there are different uh, molecular phenotypes that we see. Uh, and I'm not talking about the tumor heterogeneity where you see around 30% of the tumor having a certain mutation, sharing the same mutation and the rest being quite heterogeneous. I'm not talking about that. Uh, the key pre-IO uh, pre trials in RCC were predominantly looking at Evrolimus versus Sunitinib. The standard of care is still Sunitinib, uh, but we start to extrapolate the data that we see from the first line IOs. Speaking of which, uh, Pembrolizumab was trialed as a phase two, as a monotherapy, non-clear cell, 
uh, RCC, a good number of patients, 165 patients, uh, and their response rate was uh, a decent response rate of 26%. If you remember, it's around 52 or 55% or even coming to 60% in clear cells. So the non-clear patients do, do poorly, when, but this is a first line monotherapy, not TKI combo. Chromophobe poor response, papillary around 28% response. Their outcomes are still poorer than clear cells and the median overall survival is around 29 months. We are looking at molecular, I mean, enriching the patients. Um, and this is a trial, trial led by uh, Tom Pauls and uh, colleagues and was presented in uh, uh, ASCO earlier this month. Looking at the MET driven tumors, uh, which um, is predominantly trisomy 17 or expression of MET oncogen. And in this group of patients, uh, I just quickly focus on the med driven uh, tumors where in this group of patients, the median progression for survival, if you're able to choose the med driven tumor is 10 months. Whereas if you use the Darvalumab or Sarvolitinib combination in the all comers, all papillary, it's only 4.9 months. So there is a clear role to enrich this group of patients, but we are still not there yet. And uh, so uh, the the we, Tom is going to talk about the perioperative treatment, but I'll just talk about the cytorelative nephrectomy, which is slightly different. So if we remember in the era of 1990s and 2000, where there was no other treatment options, the only um, uh, option at the time was surgery. So it is only cancer, uh, solid cancer, where the primary is removed even in the presence of metastatic disease basically because we didn't have much options at the time. But we then knew, or because of the careful selection of patients perhaps, it was seen that the SWOG trials showed that there was a six months improvement in the overall survival in patients who had nephrectomy as in cytorelective nephrectomy and uh, additionally given interferon compared to nephrectomy. So we kind of carried on the role and when there was an uh, era of the TKI, it still showed that cytorelative nephrectomy had an around 10 months improvement. But again, there was no equipoise. The surgeons always felt that the patient, if they're well, should go on with the nephrectomy. So it's not a very balanced trial. I mean, trial, uh, data, and that's where the Cabina, which was a French uh, collaborator led trial, looked at sunitinib alone or sunitinib plus cytorelective nephrectomy. I'm trying to show that uh, sunitinib alone is non inferior. Uh, the patients were upfront randomized either to sunitinib alone or nephrectomy followed by sunitinib. And they, um, but then they're, 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 again, having a surgical led trial is always difficult, but it is it was done after many years of slow recruitment. There were a few patients who were uh, randomized to uh, nephrectomy uh, who did not get nephrectomy, and there were few patients who were randomized to sunitinib who ended up having nephrectomy. And that's that's the clinical practice. So it just showed that the overall survival, uh, it's non-inferiority strong, but numerically it, it favors nephrectomy, uh, sorry, it favors sunitinib alone. Uh, so it's saying that maybe perhaps surgery is not relevant in this group of patients. And that is shown in the kind of the overall survival where patients treated with sunitinib alone had 18.4 months compared to 14 months. Uh, but again, it is all dependent on the patient's selection. So in poor risk patients, there is no benefit to be gained at all with surgery. But in intermediate risk patients, in a carefully selected patients, that is a benefit to be gained. So this question about cytoreductive nephrectomy is not completely answered. And uh, in fairness, the, the, the presenter who was a surgeon who did say that cytoreductive nephrectomy should not be considered if a patient needs systemic treatment. So in other words, if the burden of disease output the kidney or the primary is such that it's causing like critical um, obstruction of the bronchial airways or, or uh, spinal cord compression or, uh, or significant infiltration into vital structures, then patients should perhaps go with TKI or, 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 or SACT and depending on response and depending on the burden of disease, cytorelative nephrectomy does have a role. Uh, and, and again, with this, these are TKI, but we also know that the current era of IO, IO also has a role uh, in, in, in this uh, non 
nephrectomized patients where, I mean, CR, you can't get a CR in a patient who has a kidney mass, so that doesn't count. But we do see that the partial response is around 35% in patients who have had their primary renal cancer in situ when treated with these drugs. I'll skip that because that's a perioperative. Now, the, the future, uh, there are uh, many uh, challenges and many unresolved questions. We do not know uh, because what we are basically doing is we are just juggling up various options. Uh, we are just using the first line, the uh, cabazantinib and joining with the second line, uh, axitinib or, or nivolumab or using the second line axitinib and using with first line drugs. So basically we are trying to juggle up. We're not increasing the lines of treatment. We are trying to focus on getting the best outcome at the best time because we know that we do not always move from first line to second line to third line. But we need to get better at trying to sequencing the drugs. We, are, we need to have drugs which can give less toxicity but increase the clinical outcomes, the response rates and PFS and OS. And what happens when there is failure of IOs? Do uh, a patient respond to uh, pembrolizumab if they had had avilumab and vice versa? Or will CTLA-4 inhibitor overcome the toxic, the, the resistance from uh, failure of the PD on inhibitors. We are still working on various strategies. There are multiple trials in the pipeline, pedigree, and Titan, and so on. And 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 now increasing the uh, the kind of the um, kind of options. It's triplets. So if you need plus cabazantinib, uh, uh, and or using other if antagonists. So these are the newer combinations that have been looked at. I think it as a medical oncologist. No trial should be, no no talk should be complete without the use of that word predictive biomarkers. But at the moment, it's more controversial because unlike the bladder cancer or lung cancer, we are not there with the predictive biomarkers. Majority of the trials have excluded brain metastasis, uh, non-clear cells, poor performance status. These are the unmet need and these are the patients who we see in the clinic. I'll quickly wind up the talk by talking about the kind of the newer generation of drug, the new molecule, which is a HIF antagonist. If you remember again, HIF was the main pathway, uh, but we were not able to identify a druggable target uh, until we started, uh, we bumped across this uh, MK6482, which now has the name Belzutifan, is an HIF2 uh, antagonist. It stops the dimerization of HIF2, and then by doing so, it stops the pro uh, angiogenic signals. And there has been early uh, results from a phase one trial of heavily treated patients where the response rate has been 25% with limited toxicity, just anemia and uh, hypoxia, which is an on-target effect. Uh, you can read about this nice paper uh, published by Marcel and colleagues about on the eye motion, essentially trying to give some molecular phenotyping uh, uh, based on the expression of various uh, biomarkers, PD-1s or the pro-angiogenic biomarkers uh, and so uh, so that a patient who has um, pro-angiogenic biomarkers will be responding much to much better to TKA alone for whom we can uh, avoid giving the toxicity of uh, IOs. So this is the cluster one. Uh, so you could just uh, have the myeloid inflammatory, I mean the myeloid inflammation. So you see that these patients might respond better to TKI than an uh, IO or ICPI compared to a patient where there is, and those patients are typically favorable uh, or uh, good risk patients compared to a patient with poor risk who has less angiogenic signals, but more kind of the hot, uh, to hot uh, signature rather than the uh, cold uh, angiogenic ones. It's an interesting paper. You can read through that. And at this point, I'll stop uh, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vinago. That was very comprehensive. Lots of interesting information there. Um, I'd be delighted um, you offered to, to share your slides as well. And um, we have one question just in the chat, and I think then we'll, we'll move on. I did see that Professor Piles is hopefully now able to join us. Um, but the question um, from uh, Alex Lewis was, with so many first-line options, what is your decision-making process for selecting a treatment for a new patient? 
That's a very simple question. And do we have another half an hour to answer? I think, no. I, think, <laughs> I, think I think that it's it's a very, very relevant question. I think we look at various factors. Uh, we look at the, obviously the performance status, the, the onset of response. Uh, are we trying to have a patient who will hopefully survive the first separation of the curve and then go on to have a tail of the curve effect? Uh, and uh, so, so, and the patients, um, aversion or the uh, fitness to tolerate an um, immune-related adverse events. For example, if a patient is able to withstand a 40% chance of high-dose steroids, and if you are able to say, well, okay, even if there is a more later time to respond, perhaps you might be suitable for epinevo, who once they start splitting the PFS curve, then they can go on to have a durable response. Or if a patient has a massive burden of disease closer to the cord, where you want a quicker response, the notion is that you may want to have an TKI uh, plus an IO, so a pembroaxe uh, combination. So, so uh, there is, and and there is no one size fits all. I'm afraid. Uh, so, and, and and discussion with the patient as well. So, um, just to introduce. Um, our second speaker. Um, this is um, with great pleasure that we introduce Professor Thomas Piles. He is a professor of genital urinary cancer and director of Bart's Cancer Institute. He leads a spectrum of clinical studies from phase one to randomized phase three, with the majority being translational phase two studies investigating novel targeted and immune therapies. He has written over 300 research papers and leads the European Treatment Guidelines for Bladder and Kidney Cancer. This evening, he will be providing us with an overview of perioperative therapy in renal and bladder cancer. Professor Piles, over to you. Please Thank go you ahead so and share your screen. Listen, I've got a really exciting topic to talk about. I've got perioperative therapy in bladder and kidney cancer. I've not got long to talk about it. I've got so much I want to say, so I'm going to kick off if I may. I have a number of conflicts of interest. The vast majority of my conflicts are based around the development of drugs rather than I'm giving promotional talks, which are obviously this is uh, around a, 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 a talk which I hope will be fair and balanced. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about before we start, just to give you an idea, there is no real perioperative therapy currently in these diseases. So in kidney cancer, there's none. In uh, bladder cancer, uh, we give three cycles of neoadjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy to those who can receive it. Nephrectomy and cystectomy are the standards of care. So essentially, it's a blank play, uh, playing field with the exception of neoadjuvant chemotherapy in urothelial cancer. Um, Invigor 010 was the first adjuvant trial looking at tezolizumab. It's a study that the UK participated in. Uh, in fact, we had um, a leadership role in this study it was the first to report, you'll be aware that immune checkpoint inhibitors have got a mixed record in urothelial cancer. Everyone thought they were going to cure urothelial cancer. It turns out, actually, the TMB is high, the PDL one is high, but for some reason, the drugs are not as active as we would like. This is a very negative trial. You can see the hazard ratio of 0 0.89 in the ITC disease-free survival population, and the overall survival um, also less impressive because the curves come back together. This is very troubling um, because we hope this would be the new nirvana of urothelial cancer. Um, so as it currently stands, this trial is negative, but there are things that we did with this trial, which I'll talk about in a second. We did a nivolumab study at the same time. This nivolumab study was positive for disease-free survival, but not yet positive. We don't have any overall survival results. This is very confusing. Why is one trial positive and the other one negative? Are the drugs the same or are they different? Well, that's one explanation. I suspect in urothelial cancer, they have more, diff more similarities than differences. Hypothesis number two, one of the studies had um, placebo, the other had observation in the control arm. It's possible we had a high dropout rate in the control arm of the observation trial. It's possible that that high risk population that dropped out went on to find therapy elsewhere. And therefore it's conceivable that the differences that we're seeing in disease-free survival are driven by the differences between placebo and observation. This is an interesting concept associated with trial design and underlines the relevance of choice of your control arm. We don't know yet, we have to wait till the survival of this trial comes out. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of weeks ago. This is, when you pull the trials together, 
the ESMO guideline committee group is finding it hard to approve this because it's saying, well, we need to look at both drugs together. What else could we do with the atezolizumab study? Well, we talked about the disease-free survival and overall survival, but what we did, um, and in fact, this is coming out in Nature tomorrow. So uh, this is a, a publication which um, is gonna have a high impact. We've looked at circulating tumor DNA in the atezolizumab adjuvant trial. We've looked circulating tumor DNA we've used a personalized approach. So we've mushed up the tumor, done um, whole exome sequencing. We've looked at um, circulating biomarkers, um, um, looked at circulating ctDNA, up to 16 um, mutations uh, were identified. And so these are circulating uh, DNA alterations that are specific for the individual's cancer. If you have more than two, you're ctDNA positive. We do that at baseline prior to the randomization between a tezolizumab and observation. And you can see from here, if you look being CTDNA positive, dark blue, dark red is associated with a poor outcome. CTDNA negative, salmon pink and sky blue associated with a good outcome, but really important, the tezolizumab seems to be predictive as well as prognostic. So CTDNA may be predictive as well as prognostic in this environment. We've also linked this ctDNA to the immune biology of the tumor that's been surgically removed moved at cystectomy. This is super important, um, in my opinion, because at the moment we're using radiology to detect relapse. There are fundamental flaws in radiology, and there are other trials, there are trials going on, other trials in this space, and I think ctDNA is gonna be a reliable way of picking patients who need adjuvant therapy in the future. We did sequential sample and a sample after six weeks. And what we showed was 20% of patients clear their ctDNA. And those patients that clear ctDNA have a better outcome than those that don't, obviously. And so essentially it's a dynamic biomarker as well. And it's also a biomarker associated with relapse. The super neat bit about this, in my opinion, is that we can link the tumor biology, the tumor mutational burden, but also the PDL1 with ctDNA positivity. So these are ctDNA positive patients, and you can see ctDNA positive patients that are TMB high have a hazard ratio of 0.34, and ctDNA positive patients that are TMB low, the hazard ratio is lower at 0.72. This has led to an ongoing trial that's launched. We had the launch meeting this morning. So we've got the paper coming out tomorrow, the launch meeting of this study. Um, this is a randomized phase three. So cystectomy, sequential ctDNA measurement, and when you're positive, you get a tezolizumab or placebo, PFS and OS being the primary endpoints. This is a really, uh, I think it's an exciting study. I really, if you wanna take part, let me know. We're looking for sites at the moment. This is a lung cancer study. You might say, why am I showing a lung cancer study? Lung cancer is leading the way in neoadjuvant therapy as it currently stands. This is a positive neoadjuvant trial with pathological CR associated being higher in those patients that get chemotherapy and nivolumab together. Neoadjuvant therapy, as I said before, three cycles of chemotherapy is standard in bladder cancer. So guess what? We're doing the same work in urothelial cancer, but we started at the basics. So we started by giving single agent atezolizumab, and this is a piece of work that we put together a couple of years ago. Um, and you can see here um, pathological CR rates of 31% with single agent atezolizumab. Um, we also defined a new group called major pathological response uh, that you can see these, these cycling wheels on the bottom uh, of the uh, histopathology stains. That's CD8 surrounding an immune info around surrounding tumor cells. Um, this is really exciting, in our opinion, because these path CR rates for single agent immune therapy appear higher than what we've seen historically for chemotherapy. But, and this is a big but, the monotherapy path CR rates between 30 and 40 percent, the immune combination path CR rates may be a little bit higher, maybe, but the chemo combo doesn't seem to be synergistic. So if it was additive or synergistic, it would be 30 plus 20, 55, 60%. We've not seen that. It's at 30%. This is disappointing data because we are doing some trials here looking at GEMSYS plus placebo versus GEMSYS plus an immune checkpoint inhibitor. And the 
neoadjuvant data suggests we may have been better off just going with uvalimab alone and skipping the chemotherapy altogether. I'm hoping the results of this trial will be available for us in the not too distant future. This trial is going to complete its enrollment of a thousand patients in the near future, I hope. One of the really exciting things about bladder cancer that's not being talked enough is actually CTA4 inhibition is as active, in my opinion, as pd pdl one inhibition. You can see here the combination of Dervatremi adds um, significantly to the response rates compared to Duvalimab alone. This is really important because we can use immune doublets in the neoadjuvant setting. This is in the metastatic setting, and you can see Dervatremi outperforming chemotherapy. Single agent immune therapy is unable to do that. And so we have to be using these immune doublets in the future. And this is the data for the immune combination in the neoadjuvant setting. And you see here incredible disease-free survival and overall survival data. Path CR rates 40%, you know, I'm not sure about that. We've also, in this bladder cancer setting, defined a new phenomena, which is called tertiary lymphoid structures. It looks like we have, in, within tumors, we have planets of immune activation. These planets of immune activation, CD4, CD20, CD8, FOXP3, this, um, it's not a swimming pool of equally distributed immune active cells within the tumor microenvironment. The tumor microenvironment moves and changes like the view over the top of a city with different areas uh, doing different things. And these tertiary lymphoid structures seem to be important in predicting response and is an important biomarker along with circulating tumor DNA, in my opinion. I'm going to keep going to this really important data. So this is the last piece of the neoadjuvant jigsaw, which is infortumab vedotin, which is an antibody drug conjugate. The infortumab vedotin antibody drug conjugate in combination with pembrolizumab does look additive or synergistic. Single agent response rates you would expect of 30 or 40 percent. It goes up to 70 percent in combination. And so we have CTLA4, PDL1, and infortumab vedotin as three potential targets, all of which have additive activity. And so guess what we're going to do? We're going to do a neoadjuvant study in the near future, and I'm going to be able to announce this in a month's time. I won't tell you what the drugs are, but we're going to be doing neoadjuvant triplet therapy in urothelial cancer. We're going to be using circulating tumor DNA to pick those patients that need adjuvant therapy. And I'm hoping to improve the survival with this approach by 50%. I'm going really quickly. I realized that because I've got so much to talk about. I've got five, bladder, five, five kidney cancer slides and that's it. Why is kidney cancer so be far behind in perioperative therapy? I don't know the answer to that question. This is a piece of work that we put together. This is the neoadjuvant pembrolizumab data presented at ASCO by my friend Tony Chueri last week. It's a large randomized phase three study, high risk clear cell renal cancer. It's a double blind placebo trial, a year of pembrolizumab versus placebo. And here is the disease free survival with a hazard ratio of 0 0.68 with two years of follow up. This is a statistically significant positive trial. It's the first positive trial we've had with an immune checkpoint inhibitor in this disease. As I said before, we don't currently have any perioperative therapy. In a subset analysis, you can see broad activity across subgroups, which I think is exciting. But this is important. And again, the, the ESMO guidelines committee group has met. I won't talk to you about the outcome, but the fact that overall survival is trending in the right direction as it currently stands. It's not yet statistically significant, but it's trending in the right direction, gives us confidence that this may be an adjuvant therapy with genuine activity. And when that mature survival signal comes out, I think we'll give full approval. But in the interim, I think patients will want this approach. And I hope the EMA, as well as the FDA, approves this drug. What about the tolerability? 20% discontinues for adverse events but only 7% use of high dose steroids. So really, um, I think quite tolerable. We're gonna see quality of life data in the not too distant future, I hope. Remember that inherently 
as with bladder cancer, we're over-treating 50% of patients who are cured with surgery alone. We need to find biomarkers in both these diseases. We have ctDNA in bladder cancer, which we're exploring. We don't have ctDNA in renal cancer. It doesn't express ctDNA because it's more mutationally quiet, but there are beautiful methylation signatures that we should be using in the future. This is my last, last slide. I think this perioptive space is the best place to cure patients. I think immune therapy is the best way of doing that. I think we have to select the patients. I've showed you how we can do that. In neurothelial cancer, we're gonna use neoadjuvant triplets, which I think are gonna work. And in kidney cancer, we need to develop biomarkers and get the mature data from the adjuvant trials. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Piles. That was um, some fascinating da um, data there. Um, uh, there's no questions in the chat, but just um, I was very interested in the data you presented on ctDNA for bladder cancers. And you did make the comment that ctDNA for renal cancers, it, it just isn't there. It's not um, uh, mutationally driven, but the, the potentially methylation markers are there. What, what, what are the, the studies with that and what, what, what kind of evidence do we have for that? So a friend of mine called Tony Chiwari stuck something in Nature Medicine about three weeks, three months ago. Um, and essentially what he's done is he's um, used a panel-based approach, not a personalized approach, uh, looking at methylation signatures um, in, kidney, in kidney cancer. The, um, uh, he's looked at a big cohort of patients um, post-surgery post and looked at relapse. And he's identified a cut point in which you could identify where the methylation signature appears to predate radiological relapse. Um, so I think it's an area which um, is going to be explored more. We hope, uh, and I think I can share, oh, I can share this with you. I hope to explore that in the in the adjuvant pembrolizumab trial. That's one of my ambitions. Tony wants to do that too. Uh, and so I really hope that we can do that in the near future. I think it will be successful. In the end, we are going to have to be in a position where we have some patient selection if the relapse rate is only 40%, you're over-treating more than half the patients with life-changing drugs. So we're gonna to have to pursue this approach in the end. We're not doing it at the moment. I have another question in the chat here um, about CT DNA analysis, um, uh, asking about bladder cancer. Um, are you only looking at the presence or absence of detectable CT DNA, or are you looking into the presence of specific mutations? Well, that's a really interesting question. And um, uh, so there are significant flaws with the, de with the definition of positivity. And there will always be a sensitivity and a specificity issue. Um, uh, as it currently stands, we track up to 16 mutations. Only 40% of patients, uh, and if you have two or more, you are defined as being positive. If you, but if you change that cut point, the detection of only one, that then increases to 50%. So you can increase your population by, by increasing the net, obviously. But the sensitivity and the specificity then, the, the, then changes as well associated with that change. And actually it doesn't appear to be as predictive of response to a tezolizumab because we think there's more noise. The other way you can look at this is looking at median levels. So you can actually get ctDNA levels, not just positive or negative in terms of the presence and absence of so. So each of those mutations, you, you can measure a level of, of ctDNA and we call it the MTM. And um, we can cut and get a median level. And actually when you give therapy in the metastatic disease, we tend to use that MTM approach. We can watch the median value come down associated with therapy. Um, can you track specific mutations? Yes, you can. We did a publication in Nature Medicine. Um, it was the Biscay, it was a study called a Biscay study where we looked at the combination of immune checkpoint inhibitors with targeted therapies. And we tracked the FGF altered population, but we also looked at baseline ctDNA and correlated ctDNA um, FGF alterations with tumor based alterations. And we got a really strong positive correlation coefficient. If you want to know what I think is going to happen in the future, I think we're not going to be using that much tissue. I think we're going to be using personalized therapy based off circulating tumor DNA. I think it's going to become more and more important 
And I think we are gonna pick personalized therapy based on that. I think we're gonna do it in bladder cancer within five years. I don't know enough about other tumors. As I said before, kidney cancer is some way behind, but I also think in prostate cancer, we can do that as well, particularly with DDR alterations associated with drugs like Olaparib. This is a very exciting time for the future. It's a very exciting time to be training in oncology. When I trained in oncology, which is longer ago than I'd like it to be, um, we were stuck with a few chemotherapy drugs and x-rays. We really have moved into a new era, which is super exciting. But, you know, I think the next step is going to be more exciting than the last one. Thank you. Um, so we have a few case studies um, that are um, uh, looking at our in and around immunotherapy as well. So I think we can have a bit more of a discussion about that um, within the, the case studies. Um, so I will go to our first uh, trainee. Um, this is Jennifer Allison. Uh, she's a clinical research fellow at the Christie um, NHS Foundation Trust in Manchester. Um, Jenny, if you want to share your slides. So I'm Jenny Allison. I'm one of the research fellows at the Christie and thank you so much for letting me present this case. So, um, so this was a 65 year old man who um, presented with chest pain and palpitations in the autumn of 2019. Investigations showed he had bilateral pulmonary emboli and a large right-sided renal mass that was contiguous with the right lobe of liver. He also had quite sizable bilateral adrenal metastasis and he underwent biopsy of the renal mass which showed clear cell carcinoma, grade 3, and they didn't report whether there was or was not a sarcomatoid change. He had a past medical history of hypertension, gourd, many years, and notably no autoimmune disease. And at the time of uh, being seen was on obviously Deltaparin and uh, expectant medications. He worked in the manufacturing sector, very active job um, up and about all the time, lived with his wife who kept well, ex-smoker and occasional alcohol. So when he was reviewed in the oncology clinic, he was performing status one. He was tolerating his fragment for his PE with no uh, respiratory symptoms in relation to that. He was not having any hematuria whilst on uh, fragment and generally he was quite well, uh, no weight loss and things. His bloods were pretty normal with a good renal function and his IMDC prognostic score we calculated as one, which would uh, come out as intermediate um, given that I think we would agree he wouldn't be for uh, any surveillance given the, the bulk of his uh, disease. So this is my first poll. Um, so which one of the following options would you choose for treatment? And there was no trial option available, I should say. Great, okay, so yes, I think in light of um, Bala's presentation earlier, hopefully we appreciate um, that for him, we would consider a combination of ipilimumab and ebolimab um, by the Checkmate 214 study. Um, existing of an avelumab, uh, given this was um, in like an intermediate IMDC uh, risk score, uh, we would not, uh, preferably not uh, for this man, consider that, considering he was also very fit um, and active. And the others were TKI options that were licensed for treatment, um, which could be used if he had um, contraindications to immunotherapy. So he commenced a uh, first line epineval and things went quite well up until the uh, third cycle uh, where he developed grade two colitis and hepatitis and was treated as an outpatient with oral prednisolone, which was successfully weaned with an improvement in his bowel and liver function. Um, we then decided to restart his uh, nivolumab alone. Um, so he had cycle four onwards of uh, nivolumab, but unfortunately um, developed grade four hepatitis and required admission. Uh, so just as per the ESMO guidelines treated with intravenous methylprednisolone, prophylactic medications given the high doses of steroids, and just important to still look at other potential causes with liver ultrasound given he had that um, renal mass invading uh, towards the liver and hepatitis serology and autoantibodies, they were uh, all negative. So he remained quite well and was discharged after seven days on a six week course of oral prednisolone. So I've just documented at the bottom in the table his scan results from before he started treatment and during. Um, 
So you can see that um, he had a good partial response to treatment. Um, so, uh, so in January, he developed uh, the toxicity. And despite that, uh, his, his first scan had shown um, response. Um, and then despite being off treatment for a, a good number of months, he really maintained uh, this partial response. So next uh, poll. Um, so what one of the following options would you do now? And there's still no trial. Right. Um, so yes, I think uh, it's not a, the the uh, poll suggested continue active surveillance. So I think that is a possible option because there's not been a significant change, really uh, a slight increase in the renal lesion, um, but not anything changing dramatically. And he's quite well, so that, that is an option. Um, we, I'm glad no one was suggesting me starting the immunotherapy, so that's that's great. Um, I think starting second line treatments, um, again, that, you know, he could be an option, but at the same time, as I said, things aren't changing very quickly. And the other option was to refer for surgery and metastatectomy, which is uh, what we did. Um, so I can go on to the next slide. So um, originally, particularly because of the renal uh, mass invading the liver, um, he had not been felt to be operable and obviously had haematogenous spread to his adrenals and um, but because of that had improved and he had had a significant period of time off treatment with nothing particularly changing he was referred to the urology mdt to discuss uh, surgery and um, obviously then with uh, endocrine backup because he would be adisonian um, with removal of his adrenals um, and planned for surgery. So he was actually planned for surgery in the January, but this was delayed because of COVID until the April. And we just recently got his uh, pathology results back, which had shown he still had viable tumour in the kidney. Um, but there was evidence of uh, changes related to his immunotherapy. And actually the adrenal um, glands had shown no viable tumour, which, which was interesting. Um, and he's just had his first follow-up scan, which has shown no residual disease. So I suppose uh, the future unknown for him, but um, he'll now continue on surveillance. So the reasons I chose this case were just to highlight the decisions being made regarding choices of first line treatment. Um, this patient had a good partial response to treatment, but did develop multiple IO toxicities and just highlight some of their management. He also had a maintained PR off treatment and interestingly and maybe controversially, had um, nephrectomy and metastatectomy uh, following IO uh, with interesting pathology. So um, I'd appreciate just feedback from the, the panel as to whether they've had similar cases and um, if they would have done anything differently. Thank you. Sorry, Laura. I think if I understand the question, you're asking for opinion. I, I think this is uh, this is um, this is the new concept of this treatment-free interval that is we typically are seeing with this uh, IO or your combination, and where there is a durable response, be it due to toxicity or due to a response uh, when the patient has a break in treatment, and the concept of the CR essentially he, he has an, the patient had a um, primary in situ and he's never going to achieve a CR. And, and there is always this concern that will the tumor result in more seeding or is it going to be uh, kind of an uh, overgrowing, I mean, uh, uh, enlargement locally or a distant metastatic disease. So going for nephrectomy, particularly at the time of Nadir, it, it, this patient seemed to have had a plateauing of the response to systemic treatment or, or, or kind of plateauing to response to the immunotherapy treatment in the past. So I think rendering him disease free uh, when he is fit and well is, uh, is something that we would do. Okay, thanks very much, Jenny, for presenting. Um, I'm going to move on to our second case presentation. This is Sally Martin. Um, Sally, if you want to go ahead and share your slides. Thank you for um, asking uh, me to present this case. I'm a SC4 in um, Yorkshire, and uh, this is a, a patient that I came across very recently, um, six weeks into my renal placement as I am. Um, so, just going to... 
Uh, so she presented in around about September 2018, um, age 63 at the time, with minor haemoptysis. And chest x-ray led to CT, which led to the finding of an advanced renal cell carcinoma. Um, primary was in the left kidney, as you can see, quite sizable. Um, she had pulmonary metastases, nodules, and also um, some evidence of liver metastases. A mass um, biopsy done showed that it was clear cell, um, RCC, grade one, but obviously the grade was probably not likely to re be representative of the whole tumour. Um, and it, there weren't any sarcomatoid uh, features to the biopsy. Um, her performance status uh, was zero, KPS 100%, um, otherwise asymptomatic, fit and well, no autoimmune conditions. So um, she was actually um, uh, referred to oncology, but a repeat CT was done in November, um, which showed quite um, substantial progressive uh, lung disease and also a new pancreatic tail metastases. Um, her KPS uh, maintained at 100% and uh, IMDC score was 1 uh, for treatment being required within the first year of diagnosis. Um, just for interest, her LDH was in a uh, normal range. So the question is, what first line treatment option would you choose at this point? Interesting. So I've got a 40% split between a combination immunotherapy and a combination immunotherapy and a TKI. Um, so uh, similarly to the, and 10% saying left nephrectomy at this point. Um, so similarly to the first case, um, given that she was uh, otherwise fit and well, no autoimmune conditions with progressive um, you know, active disease, um, we felt the best option would be um, dual immunotherapy. Um, the reason not to go for a nephrectomy was uh, the fact that she's got liver metastases, she's got quite progressive disease, systemic treatment was felt to be the best option uh, up front. Um, she was actually um, enrolled in the PRISM trial, which was recruiting at the time, and randomised to the experimental arm, which is shown here. So it um, was aiming to see as a primary endpoint what proportion of patients um, would have uh, severe toxicity if the ipilimumab was given three monthly. Um, rather than um, uh, as, 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 as is standard three weekly within the volume. So it's slightly, um, slightly different. And then after four doses of the ipilimumab, you went back to the maintenance and the volume app as you normally would. Um, so she was the ex in the experimental arm, as I've said. Um, she had a good partial response um, on her first restaging scan, a good response of the lungs. Um, the renal mass was marginally larger, but the pancreatic met could no longer be seen. And there was also an issue with the left lower lobe, some bronchial obstruction and some slight new lung nodules. So, uh, you know, as it might be expected on a, a first uh, CT scan, um, a, a little bit of a mixed picture, but overall partial response. Um, she went on to have stable disease on all her um, subsequent three monthly CTs. Um, she actually needed a bronchial stent for collapse of that left lung um, soon after that first CT scan. Um, which was then later removed for recurrent infections. Um, she maintained a KPS of 100% throughout and suffered only grade one or two toxicities, as, as mentioned with uh, new hyperthyroidism as well. So what would you do at this point, uh, 24 months into uh, your immunotherapy at this point? Okay, great. So yep, continue with maintenance and volume app only is the, the majority of, of people and um, the stop the volume ab option maybe because it's two years feel that this is enough response we've actually got we went on to cdf funding to provide her with maintenance in the volume ab um, and at this point we were two years in and covid was kind of settling down again or well, it flaring up again but it was felt that you know could this lady benefit from a consolidative cytoreductive nephrectomy given the size of her primary obviously um, so she was discussed at MDT, it was agreed that yes, that would be offered, given her stable scans. Um, and in February, she went on a bit of a, a delay again, I think COVID related, um, to have an open left cytoreductive nephrectomy with the pathology as, as stated with a grade 3 PT3A um, clear cell with no sarcomatoid differentiation. She made a very good post-op recovery. Uh, interestingly, she had a CT done not long before the surgery, but hadn't had an oncology review with that CT necessarily wouldn't have changed the plan anyway. It showed stable disease overall, but there was a comment that there was a couple of lung nodules that were um, slightly larger by a few millimetres, um, but overall a stable scan. 
So unfortunately, she continued on with her maintenance and volume up for weekly, but was admitted um, as soon as I started um, on the role here um, from the day treatment unit, coming for treatment, but a two week history of fatigue and night sweats. And the research nurses who knew her very well said she just didn't look right. So um, we did some bloods and she was hypercalcemic. Um, she had a, a grade one um, derangement of her LFTs, a grade two uh, thrombocytopenia, um, of which there was no evidence of DIC or HIT. Um, and it was felt uh, it could be due to the liver with the target cells, it could be immune. The endocrine panel was, was grossly normal, subclinical hypothyroidism, and her albumin had very much drifted to 17 with raised CRP and neutrophils and a mild anemia. So all of her bloods were starting to go off as well as her performance status. Um, so her CT unexpectedly showed, um, or expectedly, sorry, showed a marked progression of a pulmonary metastases with new hypervascular liver metastases. Um, so we gave her some IV fluids, trept the calcium, high dose prednisolone with a hope that some of this was immune related in terms of the blood and IV antibiotics to cover for infection with high dose steroids as, as we do. Um, and that did improve her performance status to uh, 70%, um, which equates to around it probably a good two. What would you do at this point? Okay, so second line options after an IO, IO combo are obviously, uh, you know, an evidence free zone kind pretty much in terms of the trials. And um, so I've got a one third split, one third cabazantinib, one third um, levantinib and everolimus. So um, interesting. They're both valid options. So um, obviously this wasn't looking good. Um, I think there's a 40% response rate to cabazantinib um, in the second line after IOIO. And that was what we offered at reduced dose um, because it's got the best trial data um, in the second line after sutinib, sunitinib, sorry. Um, uh, but we had, you know, the, uh, the um, sensible discussions of putting in a, 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 a a plan if this didn't work. Um, and the plan um, for discharge was to wean her steroids down and, and monitor her blood. Unfortunately, she's been readmitted to what is her local hospital, which also has um, an oncology unit with um, deteriorating bloods and a performance status. Um, and the cabazantinib has been suspended. I believe her kidney function has gone off. She's um, acidotic, possibly has a renal tubular acidosis of some kind. Um, so things are not looking very good. So I guess the discussion points I thought were very interesting were she did have quite a good initial durable response. Um, the PRISM study is a tool talking point in terms of um, trying to um, adjust how we give aminotherapy to reduce toxicities and, and, and maintain, um, maintain responses. Um, cytoreductive nephrectomy, which we've already touched upon, the timing, the difficult decisions in the intermediate risk group, um, the fact that um, we now have aminotherapy, so the need for more trials in, in this era, um, as Sir Time and Carmina were both in the TKI era. Um, and there are some prospective trials that are now recruiting to look at a, um, the best approach um, in terms of aminotherapy. I guess my main question with her is why did she suddenly progress? Was she going to progress anyway? Did the surgical and anaesthetic re um, response kind of uh, precipitate an immunosuppression um, that kind of dysregulated the good immune effect she had already? Um, it's difficult, impossible to know really. Um, and, and really just an evolving landscape with first line IO options of what to do next. Yeah, just touching on your point at the end um, about um, why she progressed, uh, that's quite interesting. I suppose throughout um, the, the, this webinar, one of the questions that's been springing to my mind, and maybe open this up to our, our panelists as well, is what biomarkers do we have for um, uh, predicting um, response to IO therapies? Do we, or, uh, is there anything that, that has been um, properly validated? The simple answer to that question, uh, Laura, is no. Uh, the, I mean, the PD-1 is a widely ex, uh, tested one. Uh, even in Checkmate 25, the first uh, IO-based trial, the PD-1 expressor, different uh, assays, uh, it was 25% of the patients were positive for PD-1 expression. And those patients, whilst were prognostically uh, having a poor response was not any predictive of response. And and again, um, Tom Pauls and other colleagues in the iMotion uh, 151 have extensively looked at, and that's where the cold 
um, angiogenic and the hot tumor, hot uh, tumors, sorry, immune hot tumors were all characterized. And again, we have not been able to give any biomarker, which is predictive of response. The same story with PDL1, around 60% of the patients resp uh, have expression of PDL1 in the Javelin study. Uh, and and their their outcomes uh, it was not even prognostic to be uh, clear their, their outcomes were similar to the patients in the overall intention to treat population so uh, we do not have uh, any uh, uh, predictive biomarkers or along the scale of the novel uh, biomarkers like the ctDNA and the ctDNA mutations which uh, uh, Tom talked about uh, quite eloquently in the bladder cancer so and and that's where we are kind of going on this IMDC criteria which is a kind of a broad bar brush. Uh, and it's 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 a clinical based criteria, but uh, it's not predictive. And you also mentioned Sally just about um, uh, kind of the the decisions about picking second line treatments, and from the polls, it was pretty mixed what what people's choices were. And um, again, I know Dr. Venugopal, you said there's still um, a lot of. Um, research in this area and we don't we don't have any clear indications yet or is that well i think i think yeah, I, I, again, I think it's an excellent presentation. I have to say both uh, Jennifer and Sally uh, very clearly clearly representing the conundrums that we see and face in clinical practice. The the second line domain, because we have been using and picking the best winners in the second line and using in the first line, we don't have, it's a dearth of drugs for second line domain. Um, now we know that the attrition or the kind of the fall off of first line to second line and third line is significant. And it makes sense to say, well, okay, let's use the best combination. And and that that's the case that well illustrated where patients seem to be doing really well. And then as if a switch has been triggered, a patient just fall off the cliff uh, as if there is a hyper progression or, 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 or massive uh, failure of response to any treatment. And that's why we would like to get the maximum drug upfront. So that is an argument to use those drugs. Um, in terms of the lenvatinib plus everolimus, there isn't any evidence post IO. IO, it's like purely first line. There is no first line evidence for len um, the, the The clear trial um, did show some improvement, but it was associated with toxicity. So I suppose of the options, cabazantinib or TKI, I mean, the um, CDF uh, in NHS England allows one of the four TKI, sunitinib, pasopinib, cabazantinib or tibosinib post IO, IO uh, lenvatinib is not allowed simply because there isn't any data. I mean, one could argue, is there any data for other drugs? But based on the first line effectivity, carazantinib seemed to be the right choice there because you have one shot at controlling the disease given the rapid progression of disease. And, and despite that, that patient seemed not to have responded. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um... I just want to thank our speakers, um, Dr. Vendi Gopal and Professor Piles for um, their, their great presentations and also our two uh, trainee Kate Creason presenters, Jenny and um, Sally. Um,